Hello and welcome to the Equinix Developers YouTube, Periscope, slash Twitter and Twitch. My name is David Flanagan. You may know me as Rockwood across the internet, and I'm a developer advocate at Equinix Metal and Equinix. Last week, I took a shot at deploying Harvester, a tool for HCI on bare metal that is open sourced by the team at Rancher Labs, and I broke it. So, one <laughs> a friend of mine and someone who works at Ranger has reached out and has offered to guide us through this again today and get it working so we can show how awesome Harvester is on Equinix Metal. So without further ado, I will invite Bastian to join us. Hey Bastian, how are you today? Hi, I'm very good. How are you? <laughs> yeah, I'm great. I'm really excited that we, we get to try this again and, and then do it together and uh, get it working. I'm uh, yeah. really excited. I think it's going to be great. Yeah. For anyone that's not aware of you, can you give us a little bit of an introduction to who Bastion is? Sure. Um, I'm a field engineer at Suse Rancher, um, based in Berlin, Germany. And I'm mainly focusing on all of our cloud native uh, products. That means Rancher, Kubernetes, everything to do with containers, and also Harvester as a, our new open source HCI solution. Awesome. Thank you very much for sharing. I, I'm going to go straight in and pop up my screen, which has got this uh, Harvester homepage and like a graphic. Can mm -hmm. you just do us a favor and you know tell us what is Harvester uh, and why should people be interested in this? Mm -hmm. Certainly. So Harvester is an open source HCI solution. And HCI stands for Hyperconverged Infrastructure. And the idea behind this is that you get a virtualization solution that you can use to power up VMs on one or more servers and then also uh, have a solution that provides integrated uh, distributed storage and integrated virtualized networking with it. Um, so in that case, it is very similar to other solutions like, um, let's say, VMware vSphere, which also gives you storage network. Um, and the great thing about Harvester and why we started this, it is, is first, it's open source which is great for starting it and trying it out. But then um, it is very Kubernetes native because a lot of times we are seeing that people are using um, hypervisor, a dis a virtualization solution, something like VMware, in the end just to power their Kubernetes clusters on-premise on their own hardware or on things like Equinix Metal. And um, when it's all what you need is and all what you want or mainly what you want is running Kubernetes, then VMware is like really large and bloated and complicated and tons of features that you don't really need. And Harvester is Kubernetes native. So everything in Harvester is managed through the Kubernetes API. So for managing VMs, managing storage, managing network, you have the same primitives, the same API concepts as for managing your containers and workloads. And you can all uh, create this through a single UI uh, manage your virtual machines, manage your Kubernetes clusters, and have this all nicely integrated. Thanks. So kind of like a short product vision where it's going to go to. All right. Does it actually, I'm assuming, does it use K3S under the hood in some way to manage that? Yes. Like, so it's using K3S under the hood. It's using Longhorn for distributed storage. That's our storage solution uh, for Kubernetes. Virtualization is done with Kubevirt. Um, so it's a lot of technologies that already exist, but then like put together in a nice way and integrated. Uh, so it's easy to run, easy to install, easy to upgrade. Thanks. Sounds awesome. Uh, so you reached out after my session last week, which I couldn't get it working. And it turned out, you said I missed it by like a PR by like one day or yeah. something. So it was just a small hiccup and a really unfortunate timing, I think. Yeah, like the uh, IPIXI example is currently pointing to master. That is because Harvester is still a better product. It's, um, yeah, it's developing quite fast and the examples are pointing to master. So they don't, they don't have to be changed like every other week. Uh, but then as it happens, when you're developing something, you release a new master version that changes something on the underlying VS and then the IPIXI examples were wrong and there was a pull request that hasn't been merged yet oh. all right so today should be plain sailing for us then hopefully uh i haven't tried the current master yet so it will be <laughs> interesting to see how it works if not we can go back to a tech version uh and have like a safety net and go don't do bleeding edge but something that actually has been tested uh, all right awesome well i'm glad you're here for support so let's click our big blue new server button and see if we can get harvester running here and one of the things I didn't really try last week, but you know, we'll see how time goes for us today. But Harvester does run as in cluster mode as well, right? So we yes. could have multiple bare metal machines with a single Harvester control plane. Yes, um, it's actually quite simple because you just boot up the first regardless. Um, 
according to documentation. And then every other node you join, you just have to put in an additional bit more configuration to say, join the already existing cluster. And then Harvester in itself figures out, okay, what role should this node be in the cluster? Should this be more control plane or more worker? Um, so yeah, it's very intelligent. That setup is very easy. Let's see how, how far we get. All right. Well, I picked the device in Amsterdam. I'm going to try the M3 large again. So this is our stupid box with 256 gig of RAM. Um, I'm, I'm assuming Ubuntu LTS is going to be fine. And we'll just um, call this. I would I would just directly go to the IPXC. Uh, oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, You're right. Um, You're yeah. right. And just because Harvester very... is in the end is the ISO that you just install. It brings its own operating system image with it that is also then managed through Harvester uh, to make it easy to install. Yes. I did know that and I forgot. Silly. But let's have a look. Uh, there was an IP. Pixie. Let me find the. Doc. I think it's not in the main repo, but uh, somewhere under iPixie examples. Oh yeah, that's right. Or... So I mean, I could. I would... What is that? Okay, so there's yeah. our Equinix one, and this is. I think there is. Uh, yeah, you can probably just directly okay. take this one. Uh, the row. Yep, so we use this IPixie install script, yep. which just has all of the things that we need. Uh, and we'll drop this in here. I've named the machine. Do we need some user data to configure this? Uh, yes, because we want to configure passwords and SSH keys uh, for the machine. And we this will be the create this. YAML, right? Yeah. OK. And then we'll drop this in. So would you change anything of this, or um, I would, you like for testing is probably fine, but I, usually I would uh, change the token to some random string that I generate, and that's large, same as with the password, uh, which is the initial root password, uh, and of course put in I could I would put in a public key. Grab one. Okay, mail public key done. Okay, so you, yeah, maybe as a pointer, if you scroll down a bit um, to the end, there is the ISO URL. Um, of course, this is pointing to the current master build that could point, and then also ideally, when you install it and actually want to run this, uh, better to like a tagged version uh, ISO, and then same as the IPC examples, uh, the URLs that are in there should also then probably point to a tagged version. Okay, so do you want to risk it and run the master version, or Let's, shall we? Let's yes. risk it. Let's <laughs> risk it. All right. So, just so this is clear, we are using the raw GitHub content for the IPEXI example, which provides yep. uh, all of the IPEXI boot configuration that we need to know. So, yep. this tells the device, the kernel, the NRD, and the boot sequence. Yep. We then configure this ISO by setting a token, an SSH key, and a password to be used for Harvester itself. And then a little bit of configuration just to work yeah. with the Equinix hardware. Yeah. Depending on your hardware, you may need to change the interface, uh, the interface name or the um, disk device name if it's different. But I think for Equinix, it's all correct, at least from my testing. We're about to find out. So I'm going to click the big blue button and we'll Ooh. just see what happens. <laughs> there we go. All right. So now we've got about. I guess 90 seconds to two minutes based on uh, last week's experiments. Uh, yeah, um, probably a bit longer because once uh, the base installation of the image uh, of, of the operating system is done, it also needs to start up then Harvester itself. So what this image is doing, it has a small base operating system and then it's running case rias inside of it. And then Harvester itself is in the end, pods that are running inside of Kubernetes. Um, so Harvester itself is also running in Kubernetes, just that you it makes it easy, a lot easier to scale, to scale the control plane. You can make use of the Kubernetes API. And that also allows them to use Kubernetes manifests, uh, to uh, the Kubernetes API to create virtual machines and set everything up afterwards. Um, and then of course, that means, of course, on the other hand, um, these containers need to uh, start up. Images may need to be pulled. Um, if you don't run it in an error gap setup, and uh, that also can take like a minute or two until everything is running. All right. Well, once it dials home, at least, 
Um, I should be able to click on this, and then we should at least be able to follow along by the out of band console. I'm assuming mm -hmm. we'll see that installation yep. running through, uh, pulling down KPS, etc. Yep. Um, is there anything in the documentation you'd like to highlight um, just now? Well, yeah, maybe if you go to the docs. Um, um, so what we are following at the moment under is under installation the iPixie uh, uh, boot install. Um, the like it basically tells you here usually you would uh, not use the iPixie script from a public web server, but maybe surf it somewhere from an internal web server for security reasons. Mm -hmm. And then it talks you talks you basically through what we actually did, um, what you all need. Um, but there's also an ISO installation, uh, which can be helpful if you just want to test it out in, I don't know, a uh, virtual box on your machine, or if you just want to install an ISO uh, manually on a server. Um, and then you get an interactive installer where you provide things like the network configuration, for example. Yeah. There's like no mention here of like a Kubernetes install. So I'm assuming like if I just have a KTS server, I, I can't just deploy Harvester to it. Like you really need to run the ISO or the um, IPC. I, um, technically you could, uh, but it's not something we are supporting uh, because it's not what we are seeing where the benefit of Harvester is. Because the nice thing is that it's all entirely integrated with storage, uh, with the different networking plugins. And if you did the, all of this manually, what you would, and also with operating system management as well, because you at some points need to update the kernel, the patches of the of the host operating systems. Um, and if you did this all manually, it would be a lot more work. You would need to install Kubernetes. You would need to install the right networking plug, CNI plugins. You would need to provide uh, a storage that has the correct features that you need uh, for it. And then basically you're replicating what the ISO already includes. Yeah, that sounds like too much work. Maybe I'll stick with the ISO. <laughs> Like the goal is um, for uh, Harvester is basically to create a HCI solution that you install on Metal servers um, to provide your own virtualization and HCI environment, and not so much to um, use it in a way where you have a Kubernetes clusters and you just want to man manage two other VMs with with something like Kubevert. Uh, then go with Kubevert directly. Then Harvester. The benefit of Harvester is tight integration. Nice. And you mentioned earlier there's like a, a, a rancher integration as well. So I can just run, does that rancher just run in a Kubert VM itself and then allow you to spin up clusters or does it run natively on the, the K3S? It's running natively in the K3S uh, cluster directly. So you can just enable it and uh, with a click if you want to. Um, and then you can have a direct connection to Harvester again and can create Kubernetes clusters directly from the UI and boot up VMs there. So it's quite neat. And, and hopefully, uh, hopefully we can show this. <laughs> and okay, so let's assume our harvester gets up and running and it's healthy. We can yep. enable Rancher. We could deploy a cluster. I mean, that would be pretty phenomenal. I'd be very happy with that. You also mentioned GitOps earlier. Can I use a GitOps pattern with my harvester to declare my, my virtual machines? Yes, that's um, one of the big goals that you can just say all your state, everything is in GitHub's, and you can configure your Kubernetes clusters uh, with GitOps, with Kubernetes YAML manifest, as well as your virtual machines that you need for non-containerized workloads. Would um, we be able to or, take a look at an example of one of those manifests? Um, yeah, let's let's see. I don't know if there's something in the documentation yet, but maybe if you look at uh, VM management. Um, otherwise, we can also. Can you click on create a VM um, if there is a YAML example there? Uh, no, maybe under reference. API reference. Let's check there. Uh, no, this is the yeah, I think I just... RESTful API. Um, we can look at this uh, later on um, inside of the Kubernetes cluster itself um, and look at the resources there. OK, well, our device has dialed home. Um, so I can SSH into this, and we can poke around. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, or do you want to wait try, for it to be healthy? <laughs> let's let's try the out of band console uh, first. I think that should give us uh, show us the installation status. Where it is. Ideally. Yeah. Uh, Let's see. So it's still starting up. 
So the also um, the out of band control sh should show us all the locks um, from the whole installation. At some point, it sh uh, should show us uh, that just harvester is ready and all the containers have started up. It's definitely at least uh, at least in the two. Uh, at least in the two zero version, uh, in the zero uh, zero two version. Um, <laughs> ah, okay, <laughs> so that is what we're expecting. So it's now fetching uh, all the user data for it. Okay, so it's just doing that so that it knows how to configure the harvester instance now, yep. provision the disk, etc. Okay. Hmm. And this is a step where if you just booted up the ISO, it would um, uh, it would show you an interactive uh, installation wizard uh, where you could fill in all your networking details and uh -huh. uh, configure your password. And now, instead of that, it's trying to fetch this from the user data. Yeah, I would have expected it to be able to fetch the user data by now. I don't know if it's just... Mm. Yeah, it should not take... So either it just work and it's just waiting for something else, or <laughs> <laughs> or we have a problem. Okay, uh, it's just oh, there we go. Yeah, and I th it may have that it downloaded the ISO uh, in the background and just didn't tell you also. Uh... Yeah, well, it looks like it's partitioning the disks now and mounting a mm. file system. That's good. You said this just takes a minute or two before it kind of gets ready. Um, maybe yeah, a bit longer, maybe. Maybe a bit longer. Uh, if it's just at the stage where it's just um, um, take uh, just download the ISO. It's now putting the ISO on the disk, and then it probably needs to reboot, and then the container uh, of Harvester, uh, the case dress cluster, and the containers of Harvester will start up. Uh. Uh, yeah, these machines with the 256 gig around, the reboots could be a bit lengthy. Maybe I should have picked a, a normal size box. <laughs> but I'm sure it won't be too long. Mm. Now, I always tried it uh, with the C3 small instances because I didn't want to pay too much. I, it's not like, <laughs> I'm not like you where I get the stuff for free, right? <laughs> um, and then, I don't know, it took like maybe three, four minutes uh, in total, but it could be that just the reboot takes a bit longer. And, uh, yeah. I mean, I think that's one of the, the drivers that people have. Like, they want the flexibility of bare metal, you know, and actually, you know, complete access to the CPU and the memory and the, the, I, the IOPS without contention from noisy neighbors. But bare metal reboot times are still very difficult. And there is people want just to run virtual machines on it to alleviate that problem. Like, they can yep. spin up a Kubernetes cluster and a VM. And then if they need to fix their control plane, it's not a 10 minute reboot cycle. It's a millisecond reboot of a VM that comes right back up again. Yeah, There's and, a lot and, of power there. Yeah. Um, another use case is also um, just to make distribution of workloads easier, because otherwise you have maybe three big servers in, in there with each 256 gig of RAM. Um, you can't then sensibly split off the control plane of Kubernetes and etcd to different nodes uh, than the worker nodes. So you have this uh, not only on one physical server, but also within one logical instance. Uh, and then you have maybe noisy neighbor problems with the workloads there a lot more than if you have VMs where you can split this off a bit more nicely. Um, and uh, yeah, you also the blast radius if you want to do maintenance on a VM is a lot lower because you maybe have 10 VMs uh, in the cluster and you, when you take out one, everything still works because you only lose 10% of the capacity. Whereas if you just have only three servers and you take out one, you lose two thirds of your capacity. So. Yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, creating multiple Kubernetes clusters uh, on three servers is then also possible because maybe you want to have two or four or five Kubernetes clusters for different use cases. Um, so it has a lot of benefits to run this in VMs. Yeah. Also, I, I noticed in the documentation last week when I was kind of playing this, I got quite excited by the, the vMotion alternative in Harvester, like the actual ability to, to move a virtual machine while mm -hmm. it's still running to another machine. Um, yep. It's just a really cool piece of functionality. It's, again, for when you want to do maintenance on one of the bare metal machines or on one of the virtual machines or whatever, you can mm -hmm. move that workload without too much downtime. Yep. 
that's really same same also with storage um because longhorn as a storage system also will store all your data of all your vms and volumes multiple times inside of your cluster if you have more than one server in harvester of course only but it will store it uh, if you have three it will store it three times um that also means if you lose a server or power one off you still have all your data and don't lose it <laughs> Okay, so we've got a reboot happening right now. So I'm assuming yeah. this is going to reboot into a working Harvester cluster. Yeah, it should now reboot into working. Like It could be that still the containers need to start and everything. Um, but you can see it with all the extracting stuff. It extracted a lot of images already that it already the ISO already ships with. So it doesn't need to load everything, everything from the internet. Um, okay, so I'm going to suggest that while that does that, shall yeah. we, in the background, spin up Harvester O2? Uh, we could do this actually. Um, yeah, let's do this. Um, okay. uh, we have the IP address of the first one already because that's what we need to connect them together. Yep. Okay. okay uh, so let's, let's do this because it will probably also take a bit of time. Yeah, so we can get this one ready. So. Right. Come on, Metal. Okay, Amsterdam. I'll just pick a smaller box this time. I'll make it a bit quicker. Um, we're going to go with iPixie. I don't know the URL yet. I'm just going to drop our IP there for the control plane. And uh, we'll grab this raw URL. So this is our iPixie script. And then we now need the join example from yes. here, which is here. And it's basically the same, uh, just in the mode is instead of this create, is the mode uh, there is join, and then you have to provide a server URL. Okay. And you have to provide the same token then for authentication. I'm pretty sure I just made that metal. Yeah, I did not uh, keep that in mind. <laughs> Uh, and this, the other things are, are the same. Um, so it's quite simple to also join an, a new server then to an existing cluster. And I'm sure I made this metal. Um, yeah, that could be different because that's the root password of the individual machine. So the token needs to be the same because that's used for authenticating uh, authentication at the at already existing harvester. But um, the password for for the root user could be different if you. Yeah, I, I'm going to confirm the token before I waste yeah. ten minutes of our life. So. <laughs> uh, metal token, okay. Yeah. Metal token. Okay, that looks good to me. Are you happy? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy. Okay. Um, and then let's also boot this up. Okay, let's wait for that to pop up as pending. There we mm -hmm. go. Uh, now, if the first one is healthy, what we would expect to see is um, any port number. Uh, I can't remember, but the it may be eight four four three or a different one. But the uh, shell should also uh, print that. Like the um, out of band console should print the UL then. Oh, I think we're still on the reboot cycle. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'll kick myself for that 256 gig around. Just all the post checks, they do take a little bit of time. So. Yeah, and I think it needs to reboot in the end like once or two times or so, or boot two times in total. Uh, two or three even. I, yeah. yeah. Well, we can be patient. Yep. Yeah. Putting from hard drive C. Welcome to the prop. That's good. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> I would have expected something like a grub screen where you can. Yeah, the, the OS your... selector. Yeah, where, the OS selector. But when I, whenever I have problems with the kid, I'd have to be bashing <laughs> the E key so I could modify it before it booted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure. Come on, little computer.
I mean, there's not been an error message, so that's at least good. But yeah. I'm not filled so, with confidence yet. <laughs> me neither, because usually <laughs> that took to take like seconds or so until. Yeah, I would expect the grub bit to be pretty fast, and then see a yeah. kernel, all the kernel logs flying past. But. Yeah. Or is this just like a problem with the console and it kind of like the connection broke or so? It could be. It definitely, definitely could be. Let's put another one. Oh. Hmm, doesn't look like it. Yeah, maybe. Maybe stuck. Yeah, uh, I never figure out thirty it, seconds, and then yeah. maybe panic. <laughs> I never figure out is this shell interactive actually, or uh, the SOS shell. So yeah. if you press something like press enter, or so is it sent to the machine, or it does, it, yeah. Okay, maybe just press enter. Oh, connection closed. Why is that? Okay, we may have a small problem. <laughs> hmm. uh, so my hypothesis last week was that potentially it didn't work on an M3 large. Yeah. That could still be the case. I mean, if Harvester has managed to install the ISO and then it's getting to grub and it's failing, we now could be into the kernel land where it just isn't supporting that hardware. Because uh, what hardware is the M the M ones? I always use the C ones so far. So, all right. Let me. I should really just keep two of these open so I don't have to keep switching. Let's copy this again. We'll use the C1 since you know it works, and I know they're yeah, the C1, yeah, the C1s uh, worked, yeah, yeah, and they're pretty fast, so I'm not too worried about the time needed. And we'll drop this in, okay? So I mean, for all we know, the IMC is now healthy and happy, but let's wait and see. Okay. Hmm. Let's see what happens with that one. But, but the M's are also just Intel CPUs, right? Uh, no, they're AMD, hmm. I believe. Okay. But that, uh, regardless, uh, it's like probably the standard 64 bit uh, x86 MD something architecture. So nothing like ARM or so. Uh... No, they are, they're, they're not ARM, no. Hmm. Uh, so. Yeah, it's an AMD EPC okay. APYC. Um, hmm. Like I said, we have had issues with M3s and um, not, especially when they're not using the Equinix Metal Prophetic kernels. So I'm not surprised. Uh, I should just learn to use the more commodity hardware instead of trying to show off all the RAM. However, okay. we do have uh, this one now spinning up. This, jo this one that's joining us now never Yeah, worked, this will right? definitely uh, not be functional as soon as the other one is not functional. All right. So. Let's try. Do we have a standard SSH interface on that machine? If it's still stuck in grub, uh, that's probably not the case. Yeah, I don't think so. Okay, we'll try the serial one more time, just as we have a few more minutes to kill. I think this one is altered. Yeah, I don't. 
think it's a weird possession though I, the fact that we're not getting anything and then the serial versus SSH connection has been dropped confuses me uh, maybe it's dropped because you created a new one um, can you have more than one SOS console sessions in parallel oh, you may be right I've never tried it before <laughs> so I have no idea hmm. Just there's a bit of a coincidence that it uh, as soon as we create a new one, it drops the old one. You're right. Hmm. Well, I'm not getting help text either, so yeah. we'll see. Okay, let's let's put all of our bets on this C1 yeah. small then. But it would be definitely interesting, uh, maybe also then to figure out why it's not working uh, on the M3 ones. So maybe something to follow up with the colleagues from engineering. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I would like really like to see an error message on the band console. Um, yeah, any no. kind of information. Like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, just, like, I, I don't know, invalid kernel, blah, something or so, right? Yeah, definitely. Or it could be something within the ISO uh, that is broke on master. Uh, that is, of course, also a oh, possibility. Yeah. When I spun up to C1 small, I really should have moved away from the master to tagged just in case. Yeah. We can, should we do uh, to uh, like a tagged one in parallel? Yeah, well, yeah, let's let's rule out all potential error scenarios here. Yeah, I'll say, let me, can I send you a chat message through here? You can, yeah. There's a private chat in the bottom. Ah, there, okay. Um, then I'm just, I have an IPXC script available for that. Uh, oh, perfect. That goes to zero to zero. Okay, so Amsterdam, C1 small, pixie, URL, this, and I'll differentiate that from the other one. So let's tag. And some user data. And, and we want a create example. And I'm going to just keep using the same token so that I don't confuse myself later. Yeah. Um, and then you have to change uh, also the ISO URL to point to the tagged version. And what was the tag? Sorry, it was zero uh, two. V zero two zero. Yeah. Looks correct. Okay. This one has an out of band console now. So so let's see. Uh if it was a kernel problem or an ISO problem. Yeah. Right. Not really sure what stage of the reboot is yet. So we'll give it a minute. And we have our tagged one. Uh, I mean, so you're quite confident on the tagged harvester, right? Uh, at least it worked last week when I tried it. <laughs> and the URLs <laughs> didn't change, so... Um... Uh, I'm just going to keep spinning up devices. Yeah. We'll, we'll have a, a join then on a tagged one. And even if we can start to play around with the C1 small first, yeah. we'll then jump over and we can do the cluster mode on the other one. Yeah. Uh, we're just going to balance a lot of plates here now. That's the plan. Mm -hmm. uh, copy this URL. And we'll call this tagged harvester join. And the user data will be a little different. We'll jump over here. Okay, so we need the IP address. Tag harvester. I'm closing too many tabs. Hopefully we have an IP address. Yes, we do. 
Uh, I mean, would you use the public IPv4? Would you use the management interface? Oh, uh, we can use the public IP here. Yeah. Oh. Okay. Uh, what would you encourage people to do in the real world? Use the private IPv4? Um, in the real world, um, like the uh, the server has two network interfaces, right? Uh, a public one and a private one, correct? Well, yeah, by default they're bonded, but there is a private okay. IPv4 and a public IPv4 available, yes. Mm. So so what you can, it's actually, inter... we would need to look up if, if the private IP works here as well, but the, the result is going to be the same. Uh, yeah, and... I mean, either way, the KTS is binding to the public IPv4 anyway, yeah. so I guess you could just use it. Okay, because um, we need to bind it to the public one uh, because we also want to access uh, the interface at some point, right? Um, otherwise, we would need to have kind of like, I don't know, um, set up a VPN or uh, provide some kind of jump post or so that we can connect over. Okay, so we can see the file system has been created on this one. Mm. Uh, based on what we seen last time, this should start. Yeah, uh, I think it's still, soon. it's a bit, left and right, but I think it's the process where it's extracting all the images. Yeah, the, the serial console is not wonderful, right? Yep. <laughs> Good in a pinch, but not something you could probably work from. It's good to have something like this uh, if everything else fails, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. Uh, I've definitely it, broken a few machines and relied on it. So, um, yeah. Okay, good. That's a reboot. Let's so, see if we hit our grub thing again, or if it just works. Okay, and then we've got our tagged harvester has now dialed home, so that should be also running through the same installation process as this one. Yep. And our join one will just be a few moments. And uh, I'm not feeling confident enough to delete any of the ones I'm not using. <laughs> Pretty sure we don't need that or that, but I'm not 100% sure. Let, let's keep them. Uh... <laughs> Maybe it just took uh, takes crop like 10, 15 minutes to start up and load. Who knows? Yeah, who knows? Exactly. Who knows? Uh, we still have that tab there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Though I assume that will not happen. Oh, okay. that's good. So this one is booting. Yeah, the reboots are a hell of a lot faster on the smaller hardware. We should see crop momentarily. And I'll try not to press E. There we go. Oh, okay. So grub worked. And yeah, I think you can just press enter uh, or wait three seconds. And uh, we have a kernel. Yay. Okay. So it was something probably yeah. related uh, to the uh, OS kernel not supporting the hardware correctly. Yeah. Like, like I said, we, we have seen this before on the M3. It's, um, it does require a, bit, a few more modules on the kernel that aren't really default. So. But at least we have something running. So what you said now is this one's going to boot, pull some container images, run K3S, run the harvester yep. stuff, and then we should be able to hit that web interface. Yeah. Um, so as soon as the OS and network, everything is up and running, uh, we should see a console uh, that tells us, okay, Harvester is starting up. Um, yeah, this one. And this will, uh, it's currently still unavailable because everything needs to start. K3S needs to start, the containers need to start. Um, and uh, at some point, uh, it should still tell us um, the, the, the status is available and ready, and then it should print also the management URL, so that you can we could access then. Cool. Good. That's good progress. Uh, so I'm going to be impatient and just use the IP address in the port. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it won't be there, but it's going to be there any minute. Uh, so I, I'm not 100% sure that it's 8443. It could be a different port. All right, okay. Um, let me maybe in the meantime 
Was that swap? Like, oh, oh uh, sorry, it's okay. It's, yeah, it's, it's 3443. Because 8443 is a port um, in the end of Harvester that it uses to join all the nodes together. And uh, 3443 is in the end a port that goes to the Ingress controller that serves then the UI. So there is an, I assume, traffic Ingress controller or Nginx Ingress controller. I think it's either one of those, probably more like an Nginx Ingress controller that in the end serves then uh, the Harvester UI. And so that means the cluster is already there. And um, can you go to the console? It should hopefully also tell us at some point. Uh, hmm. I'm not sure where it's got this IP address from. Is it? Isn't this? Attached at, on the network interface on. Oh yeah, you're right. <laughs> I was oh wait oh yeah Tarek oh, okay I'm just, see I'm getting confused with all my machines. The tank harvester <laughs> is the one that we have in clustered mode that won't be ready yet. Okay, cool. Um, we don't seem to have a web UI quite yet though. Is that just a waiting game? Yeah, uh, yeah, I would say so. Interesting. My dog going wild. <laughs> I'll just mute for 10 seconds. Yeah. But you can already see uh, there are the uh, all the Calico network interfaces coming up in the logs. Um, yeah. That is from Ta -da. pods. And ta -da. <laughs> um, now you can specify the admin password. Okay, so anonymous that agree, go. And we have Harvester. Yay. Very exciting. Um, so yeah, the next step would be to boot up a virtual machine, right? Um, can you just quickly check the console if everything is up and running? Um, it should tell us. Uh, because I think still there are some pods that are starting up. Like everything, every time it tells us uh, there is a Calico interface that becomes ready, it means another pod started. Um, well, let, let, let's just start. Let's it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we need an image first. Okay, so I guess I can just pull images from anywhere online? Yep, like an Ubuntu image or so. Uh, like the standard cloud uh, yeah. images you can use. Yeah, I put, I put server, but yeah, it's the cloud ones. There we go. And we'll go, what's the latest version? I don't even know anymore. Uh, Focal, I think. Focal. Uh, at least it's the latest LTS. Oh. All right. So does the, it's just going to be the IMG one, right? Uh, the yeah, the cloud uh, IMG. AMD64. Yeah, that looks good. Okay, so and you name. could provide anything as images. They also understands it understands multiple formats. Um, ah, nice. Yeah. And you can also upload files, but of course, it's easiest to just put in the URL where it downloads it. Does that mean if I've got a local workflow where I'm building Packer images, like I could just upload that that output? Sure. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so we've added our Ubuntu Focal. And can I create a volume too? Um, they will create it automatically. Um, I would say, uh, oh yeah, okay. If I wanted to create like a data volume that I wanted to move between VMs, would I just do create here? Uh, yeah, that could you could do, yeah. And then you could attach uh, the volume. Yeah, I just want to play with all the buttons. That, that's that's <laughs> my, my problem here. So uh, size. 64 gig. Edit a channel. Ooh, and there you can see, uh, in the end, uh, it's a persistent volume claim. Hey, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. I like that. OK, so let's go to our virtual machine. And there we can see, we'll do Rockwood 1. Uh, give me, uh, what is this? 
Centicores, Melicores, uh, Cores. Yeah, course. I think that's Caesar. Yeah. Core. Uh, let's do four gig of RAM. Well, uh, you can create one directly from there. Okay. Uh, where I attach my volume? Oh, no, wait, that's that volume. And then you could add, add existing ones, for example, existing as disks there. Cool. Uh, I don't need to really configure anything else. Is, it, is that enough? Is that? Um, we would need to specify the image somewhere. Uh, if you go to volumes again, um, you should specify an image. Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. uh, so our Ubuntu image. Um, can you check networks? So by base, base, uh, by default, um, every VM gets a management network, but this meant not for just for management purposes, SSHing into the VM, not so much meant for actual traffic um, that you run over it. So you could add multiple networks and this will be in the end VLANs. Uh, we would need to set a bit of stuff on Equinix itself uh, to support VLANs there. So let's maybe skip it for now. Um, yeah. But for, um, then node scheduling, um, the default is run it wherever something is available, but you can also pin it to, pin it to a physical node. And here you can um, override the host name if you want to do, and also specify uh, cloud config as user data, either by just pointing it in there or by just um, pro choosing it from a template to configure then, I don't know, a install additional packages directly on boot or configure the networking differently. Uh, if you wanted to configure static IPs, for example, for additional VLANs. Okay. Are you happy for me to click create? Yeah. What can possibly go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so what have we got here? Uh, this is just some configuration for yeah. our array. Okay. Yeah, you also have access then to the backups uh, there. You can configure networking. You can configure the templates for cloud in it and so on uh, there. And under settings, that could be interesting while this is booting up. Um, there is a setting somewhere called um, activate rancher or something, or enable rancher. I hope so, at least. No, I, I no. don't see one. OK. Hmm. No, then. OK, then this is different to uh, the tagged version. OK. Uh, well, we've got the tagged version one just coming up. So why yeah. don't we? Then I actually also don't know how we would access the rancher that's inside of that here. Um, but um, you can click maybe on the uh, name uh, to go to the detail page. Um, and what I wanted to show there in the upper right you have this YAML uh, button that shows you the reference, the configuration as YAML, and then you can see uh, this is a, the this is how you could create something like this with your GitOps flow. And in the spec, you basically have what we just clicked uh, configuration for all the interfaces. Nice. So I guess the startup time right now is is just right in that image. Uh, like yeah, or something? Yeah. I'm, I'm not really sure how it works. To be honest. Is the <laughs> image already there? Um, can you check images? Because I think it was also downloading when we looked. Okay. Well, yeah, I guess. Well, it says active. Does that mean it's downloaded? Okay. Or? Um, the, the, it's interesting. The progress of 0%. zero percent. <laughs> Did I break it? Um, can you? Go back to the virtual machine. Let's see if we see something in there. Can you? Mm -hmm. hmm. I don't think we have an image. I mean, it feels like that should be 100%. What happens if I click this URL? Um, this is just a link. Uh, it will probably open this one in your browser. Yeah, it does seem OK. Yeah, but yeah. I think this is just the URL where it came from, right? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to make sure I hadn't messed okay. up uh, copying and pasting that. Uh, 
True. Hmm. Let's maybe <laughs> give it a bit more time. Okay, why don't we check the status of a yeah. tagged one? That's because we may have a bit more confidence in this yeah. one. <laughs> so that was what's happening if you do leading edge. Yeah, I'm having fun. I'm really yeah. it's awesome. Where is this at? Uh, so we have had it a while, so I'm going to grab the IP and see yeah. if we can. So the port should be the same. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't too far behind. I think we were just about a minute or maybe less. Uh, but we'll wait till we see something on the console. We did change the ISO URL uh, there, right? Yep, on both. Okay. On both, yes. okay. I don't know if I was asking myself a question or answering your question, but I, I do believe we updated the URL on both. Okay. Okay, let's see. Give us a wee refresh. I'm going to try importing one more image to see if can it you, behaves differently. Can you, can you, yeah, that's true. Let's do that, yeah. Um, what would also be interesting, yeah, let's can do the same. Uh, Want me to try the VMDK or, or the uh, no, the EMG is actually the right one. Um, okay. oh, let's maybe try we could do something different than Ubuntu. Uh, well, yeah, doesn't HashiCorp publish a whole bunch of uh, images? Oh. Yeah, let's discuss. Checking through my list. Mm. Could I'm sure they used to publish images. Could try a send, try a send to us. Uh, I have a URL for that. Yeah, drop it in the thing. Let's try yeah. it. Thank you. All right, so this is a QQ image this time. You can also just put in the URL. It uh, will provide, if the name is empty, it will fill it out on its own when you paste it in again. So, I would think that it's actually expected because, as far as I know, it will download the image only if it use if it's used the first time. Okay, uh, so maybe we should faster. Um, but what was curious that uh, it did not work uh, with the Ubuntu one. Uh, this is filled out already. Yeah, let's keep it like it. just this basic. I would say. Okay. And Is there a way for me? To, would it report errors if I didn't have enough CPUs or RAM or something like that? Um, yeah, it should be plenty for just a for just a wish. Okay. Um, what we also can do, um, maybe you can on the upper right. You see there is this console button. Mm -hmm. With that, you get a kubectl shell inside of this cluster. So you could, for example. Um, yeah, I think get virtual machines and ah, uh, look at that. Ah, un failed unschedulable. Uh, so I said that the CPU, is, the RAM can you do uh, describe on this? Yeah, all over virtual machine maybe, because maybe we did uh, okay. Uh, guest not running. Uh, Volume type has no storage class defined uh, in the volume snapshot. Oh, so when I, I so I got too fancy creating a, a volume. Yeah, well, maybe we, maybe <laughs> we did something. Can you check get store kubectl get storage classes? We should have a storage class. Yeah, but I think it, as if as a problem from the volume. Uh, I... Okay, so we have a storage class. Um, and now it would be interesting to see. This uh, disk one volume uh, that we can you check volumes again? So the VM is actually running the CentOS one. Hey, yay! 
Um, but can you check volumes first? Uh, no, these are the disks. Uh, can you do, I think it was a persistent volume claim. Um, I think there may be a persistent volume claim oh, that is uh, the unknown. Box at the box. I appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, okay, yeah, there, yeah, our data volume is pending for some reason. Can you describe that? Why it's pending? Um, I can't read. Yeah, it says filter provision, claim selector not supported, storage class Longhorn. Um, I think it's okay. just when I created the volume here. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's, yeah, it also says stay, uh, face still pending because it basically gets the information from there. We should have enough disk space, all right. Yes. Um, okay, but it, 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 I think claim, we can ignore it, right? <laughs> yeah, claim selector not support. I haven't seen that one before. Uh, we do have our CentOS running. Yeah. Um, or you have a serial console, or you can open it in uh, web VNC. Um, we did not provide a password, right, and user data. We right. just put in your SSH key, so I guess we can only use SSH. Um, and in this case, uh, we only have the management interface available, and that is a private IP address. If you just close this window. You can see it has a IP, private IP address to the cluster, uh, but you can SSH uh, into it uh, from your uh, VM or from the server directly. Um, I think even if you add, can you open a shell? You can all even do, should be able to do this from all right. here. Uh, oh, yeah, from here. This, this oh, but then my SSH key won't be there. Ah, okay, yeah. <laughs> so it's probably better to forward your private key uh, to the VM, yeah. Okay. I'm going to hit refresh on this. Oh, I don't think our tag one worked. Hmm. Interesting. Why? Hmm. Let's, let's let's stick with, with this one. OK, so we are on 135. Yes, OK. So we're going to do BSSH. How do I forward my SSH key? Um, yeah, I don't know if you, if you have it activated. Otherwise, it would be with uh, minus O forward agent equals yes. That's an additional option. Uh, you said minus O, right? Yeah, this forward agent equals yes. Okay. Uh, I'll put it into the chat. So minus O, then forward agent equals yes, and then it will definitely forward it. Or should okay. uh, metal token. Why is it asking for a password? Actually, it should. Mm, we provided. Uh, it's harvester. The name, no, the username should be either harvester or rancher. Uh, I think that's good. Uh, try rancher. Yeah. Ooh, okay. So um, now we have our agent available. We should be able to SSH root, uh, and then the management interface, right? Yeah. yeah. And I don't know if it's root or CentOS for CentOS for the CentOS image, but one of them. Yeah. You need to do CentOS. Yay. Well, no yeah, sense, but, yeah. <laughs> okay. but we have access to the VM. Yeah. All right, that was cool. Yeah, uh, and yeah, maybe we can do the whole rancher integration another time when I figured out why there is no rancher uh, button available there. But yeah, so you said it should just be under. I, I thought there were something uh, at least in the older version. There's something under settings uh, that. Uh, but I don't see it anymore um, there. So maybe that changed. No, well, you know what? We we have gone over what I, yep. I, I, I asked you to join me for. So I don't want to keep too much of your time. But yep. um, that was... was definitely fun. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I learned was... something about kernels. <laughs> yeah, it was a whole lot of fun. I, I, I just I think Harvester is going to be so important and bare metal infrastructure over the next couple of years. You know, 
the caveat to people that are watching is that this is still 0 0.2. This is yep. still very early. There's a and lot it, of moving We parts. even have a uh, master build that was probably built out last night. So we did something with nightly uh, development <laughs> builds. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so fast so bare results. Project. But if you want to run virtual machines on your bare metal with uh, Rancher integration to provision Kubernetes clusters, this looks like a really promising and viable option. I think what we'll do is we'll, just, we'll keep an eye on this project and maybe Bastion will be so kind to yep. join me regularly and we can do updates and play with it more. But a very, very cool project and it was good to get it running and get that virtual machine going. Um, Although I feel that I kept throwing Spanner on the works and trying to break it with like the M3s mm -hmm. and then, oh, I'm going to create a data volume and all these things. Like uh, I should just stick to the script and stop. Yep. stop going well. If, um, so if you um, try it out, um, first of all, don't run this in production yet. Uh, this is like way too early for that, but please try it out. That will be really great. And if you have feedback, there is a Slack channel at slack.rancher.io. Um, there you can provide, there's a harvester uh, channel inside of the Slack and there you can provide feedback and also get in touch directly with the engineers. Awesome. Well, Bastian, thank you for joining me and guiding us through that today. Uh, okay. We'll do a follow up for, for Rancher and Kubernetes another yep. time. But uh, I hope you had fun. Uh, I'll see you again soon and have a great day. Yep. Bye bye. bye.